In this section, we're going to look at geometric measurement and basically everything that has to do with three-dimensional figures and solids. So I wanted to show you how you're going to see these formulas on the reference sheet because, again, don't memorize any of this stuff. But the one downside to these formulas is there's no diagrams that go with any of the formulas. So you can see that it gives pyramid and then it has the surface area formula. Um, it will have the volume formula after that. Um, right cone, right cylinder, right prism, and a sphere. So this is great, but it's really helpful to look at the diagrams and know what all of these pieces mean. There is a section on the formula sheet that tells you, for example, that B represents the area of the base, that P represents the perimeter of the base, and that L, for example, represents the slant height. But if you don't know what those things mean and you don't know how to find the base, these formulas are going to be useless to you. So that's where I want to start and go over each of these figures and their formulas. And we'll get this thing out of the way so we can look at those figures. All right, so the first thing is a prism. Now, you guys know prisms. Sometimes you think of them as like those little triangular things that light comes through and buzzes out the other end and like a rainbow or whatever. But really, a prism is something that has two parallel and congruent bases, and then the rest of the, of the figure has to be rectangular faces. So you have to identify which piece is the base. So here, this first one is a rectangular prism. So really, any pair of sides could actually be the bases because they're all parallel and congruent, and all the sides are rectangles. But in the second figure, which is a triangular prism, the base has to be one of these triangles, or actually the two triangles. But you have to identify those pieces as the bases so that when you find the perimeter of the base, you're finding the right perimeter. When you're finding the area of the base, you're finding the area of one of those triangles. So you can plug things in correctly into your formula. Um, in a cylinder, there's only two variables that you have to worry about. Um, the radius, which is, of course, the radius of the circle on top, and then the height. So the surface area is 2 pi r times the height plus 2 pi r squared. So we're adding together the area of the sides plus the area of the two, the top and the bottom, which are both circles. In a pyramid, um, there's several things that you need to find out. First is capital P, which is the perimeter of the base, and so you have to like think about what kind of shape the base is and add up the lengths of all those sides. Then you want to find what we call the slant height, and that is L. The slant height extends from the vertex down to the middle of one of your sides, and it has to be perpendicular. So you can see there's like a little right angle in your diagram there. Uh, my, my red drawing wasn't very good because it's not one of those edges. It's coming down in the middle there. That's your slant height. B, of course, is the base. So capital B is the area of the base. So you have to think about what kind of figure is the base. A lot of times it's going to be a square, but it might be a triangle. It might be a rectangle. So how do you find the area of those figures? Um, and then, of course, the volume is one-third the area of the base times the height. All right, so we have all of these um, variables defined over here, and that's going to be defined on your AIMS reference sheet as well, but you've got to be familiar with what each of the parts are, how to find the base. With a cone, again, you only have two variables that you have to worry about, actually three. You have the radius, which is going to be the radius of the base, of that circle. Then you're going to have the slant height, and for the cone, the slant height just is one of the edges of the cone. And then you have the height of the cone, which has to go perpendicular and meet up with the center of the circle that's the bottom. Lastly, we have a sphere. Sphere only has one variable that you care about, and that is the radius. So the surface area is 4 pi r squared. The volume is 4 pi r cubed. Make sure you're highlighting the difference between the square and the cube there. So let's do a couple of examples of finding surface area and volume. Here I gave us a, um, let's see, this is a square pyramid, and we want to find the surface area and the volume of the figure. So I start by writing down the two formulas that I need. Surface area equals 1 half P, L plus B. Remember, P represents the perimeter of the base, L represents the slant height, and capital B represents the area of the base. So the first thing I'm going to do is figure out the values of all of the variables that I need. So, for example, every single side is 7, so the perimeter of the base is 7 plus 7 plus 7 plus 7, or 28. 
The base is a square, so the area of the base would be 7 times 7, or 49. The slant height is given to me, it's listed right here as 11.5 kilometers. The only variable that I haven't been given is the height of the pyramid. So how am I going to find the height? So look carefully at this triangle, you can kind of see drawn in here. Since that height is perpendicular to the base, that is really just a right triangle. We know this side is 11.5. Now since the whole length of one side is 7, this little piece of the triangle is going to be half of that, or 3.5. And then if I want to find the height, I'm just going to use the Pythagorean theorem. So 3.5 squared plus h squared equals 11.5 squared. Square those values. We're going to subtract 12.25 from both sides, so we'll get h squared equals 120. And then if we take the square root of both sides, we'll get the height to be about 10.9. So now I have all the values of my variables. Now I'm just going to plug them into each one of my formulas and simplify. So surface area goes here. That's 1 half the perimeter times the slant height, oops, plus the area of the base. I think I forgot that in here. So add in the area of the base. 49. There we go. And then for volume, one-third the area of the base times the height, so one-third times 49 times 10.9, and then just multiply and simplify those values. Make sure you're using correct units with surface area and volume. For surface area, you want to have your units squared. For volume, you want to have your units cubed, whatever those units were that they gave you in the problem. Okay. Another thing that you might be asked to do on any of these surface area volume type problems is to find some missing parts. So this is one where you have to work backwards. So for example, the volume of a sphere is 36 pi cubic centimeters. Find the surface area. Well, think about it. To find the surface area, I'm going to use the formula 4 pi r squared. The only thing I need to know to find it is the radius. It didn't give me the radius. It gave me the volume. So that's where I'm going to start. Start with the formula for volume, and then we're going to work backwards to solve for the radius. So the volume is 36 pi. We know that that's equal to 4 thirds pi r cubed. First thing I'm going to do is multiply both sides by the reciprocal of that fraction to get rid of it. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 3 fourths. 3 fourths times 4 thirds is 1, so this side reduces to just pi r cubed. And then 3 fourths times 36 is 27. So we have 27 pi equals pi r squared. Divide both sides by pi. Now you have 27 equals, or not pi r squared, pi r cubed, excuse me. Divide both sides by pi, then you're going to have 27 equals r cubed. So we take the cube root. We're saying what number times itself three times equals 27, and that's 3. Now that we know the radius is 3, we can go back and plug that into our surface area formula, 4 pi r squared. 3 squared is 9, 9 times 4 is 36, so our final surface area will be 36 pi centimeters squared. I have seen practice problems where they have this as maybe answer choice A, and answer choice B might be 36 pi centimeters cubed. So pay really close attention to your units. Hopefully you won't run into anything like that. All right, here's another example. A square pyramid has a surface area of 144 meters and a side length of 8 meters. What is the slant height? So basically we know this is 8, we know this is L, we know that's 8, and we know that's 8, and we know the other side is 8. So go back to your surface area formula, 1 half the perimeter of the base times the slant height plus the area of the base. And basically what we know is that the surface area is 144. We know the perimeter because we knew each side was 8, so the perimeter is 32. We know the area of the base is going to be 64, 8 times 8, because it's a square. And then all we have to do is plug those values into my formula and work backwards. So 144 equals 1 half times 32 times the slant height plus 64. So I'm going to simplify um, some of these things. Subtract 64 from both sides. Let's see if I can't get rid of this altogether. There we go. Subtract 64 from both sides gives me 80 over here equals 1 half of 32 times the slant height. I multiplied both sides by 2, um, then divided by 32, so you get a slant height of 5. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is a really, really common thing that I've seen on every released item sample of AIMS um, and pretty much every standardized state test that I've ever seen, and that has to do with changes in dimension. So I want to go over some general rules, but then I also want to talk about like how to organize your ideas and your thoughts to figure out the answer every time because I don't want you to just memorize a bunch of rules. All right, first of all, if you're dealing with perimeter and area, 
When all the dimensions of a polygon are multiplied by some factor n, the new perimeter is going to be n times greater than the original. The new area, however, will be n squared times greater than the original. If you're working with circumference and area, when the radius of a circle is multiplied by a factor of n, the new circumference, which is just like perimeter, is going to be n times greater than the original. But the new area will be n squared times greater than the original. So let's look at some examples of how you might work this through and figure this out. Okay, we got Sue. She draws a triangle with a perimeter of 12 inches and it has an area of 6 square inches. She then draws a similar triangle that is five times as large. What are the perimeter and area of the larger triangle? Now in problems like this, we don't always know what the original radius was, or it might be difficult to find out. Since this is not in terms of pi, it would be hard to figure out what the original radius was. But we do know the relationship between the old perimeter and the new perimeter. So for my new perimeter, it's going to be n times as large as the original. So since I'm drawing it five times bigger, it's going to be five times as big as the original perimeter or circumference, which was 12. So my new perimeter is going to be five times 12, which is 60. The area, however, changes by a factor of n squared. So we take the original area, which was six, multiply by five squared, which is 25, and 25 times six is 180. Now let's look at another example and how you might figure this out. Not 180, right? 150. I said 180, but I meant 150. Okay, so in another example, we just know that the radius of a circle is doubled. We don't know what the radius is. All we know is that it was doubled. And this is an example where you can go back to your formula and plug in what you know about that radius. If my original radius was r, then my original area was pi r squared. If I double the radius, my new radius will be 2r. So just plug that into your formula for area. My new area will be pi times 2r squared. If I have 2r squared, that's 2r times 2r. That's 4r squared pi. Now, if my original radius was pi r squared and my new radius is 4 pi r squared, my new, my new area, excuse me, is 4 times as big. So if I double the radius, my new area is going to be 4 times as big. And you can always go back and plug in your variables like this to see how much bigger something is. Now if we're changing dimension in something three-dimensional instead of just circumference and area, I would really recommend going with that, um, that strategy to figure out how much bigger something is. But let me just give you some basic ideas about how dimensions change. If you change one dimension of a figure, so example, if you took a prism and you just made it longer but not wider or taller, then the new volume is going to be changed by a factor of n. If you change two dimensions by a factor of n, then the new volume is going to be increased by n squared. If you change all three dimensions by a factor of n, so for example, all three sides are doubled, all three sides are tripled, or all three sides are cut in half, then the volume is going to change by a factor of n cubed because you're changing three different dimensions. So let's look at an example. If we have a rectangular prism and it originally has a volume of 350 cubic inches, what's the volume of the prism if the length of each side is tripled? So really, we're increasing each side by a factor of 3. If each side is tripled, then my volume should increase by a factor of 3 cubed. Well, 3 cubed is 27. 27 times 350 is 3,150. But here's another way you can figure this out. If you have a rectangular prism, let's say this side is x, this side is y, and this side is z. If you triple each side, this side is 3x, this side is 3y, this side is 3z, right? So my original volume would have been x, y, z. My new volume would be 3x times 3y times 3z. Well, 3 times 3 times 3 is 27. So you can see that my new volume is 27 times greater than my original volume. So take the original volume and multiply by 27. I really like this method because you can figure out what's going on in any case. You don't have to memorize. If three dimensions are changed, it's going to increase by n cubed. So I would recommend that. Um, I want to give a shout out to the kids who've been coming every single session. Thank you, Court. Thank you, Court. Thank you, Court. Okay, awesome. I'll see you guys when we go over this uh, the next time we meet.